Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is September 14th, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, the refugee tidal wave continues as the global elite use the crisis to destroy Europe. Meanwhile, ISIS extremists say they are ready to flood the borders with a half a million terrorists disguised as migrants. Then, a former CIA insider claims that U.S. intelligence is altering their reports on ISIS. So this is a very, very serious charge. I think it needs to be fully investigated. And why wearing a Hillary for President t-shirt might get you punched in the face. They thought it said Hillary for President. He said, I was seconds away from sending my bar back over here to, to punch you in the face. Since you're wearing a Hillary for prison shirt, you don't have to buy drinks here. Everything's on the house. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We've reached a critical juncture in the globalist program. That's why we're launching Operation Money Bomb 2015. And with the money we raise from this, we will be able to stay on the satellites and get on cable stations across North America, reaching tens of millions of more people right at the time they're receptive and looking for answers. So join us this September 16th and 17th. We're charging up, getting ready, and going in. Something we've been documenting for a while, at least here domestically, is the influx of immigrants coming into the United States of America. Now, I understand there are many people, and I talked about this last week as well, that are trying to flee situations such as uh, the Contra Wars or the ill effects of those things in Central and South America. You also have people migrating from Syria because of the war between Assad and the Al-Qaeda rebels. I completely understand that. But it's getting to a point where countries around the world are realizing, well, as bad as your situation is, if we bring so many people into our country, that won't be the most economically feasible thing. And uh, last year, I had a chance to speak to a gentleman, and he was saying to me about the people coming in from Central and South America, is that we spend all these, this money on wars, and we spend money on this, and we do that. And I agreed with the guy on that part. I said, we have money for war, but we can't feed the poor. But the issue is that's big government spending. When, these, uh, when immigrants are going to places like McAllen, Texas, or Marietta, Marietta California, the taxpayers are having to foot that bill in those particular areas. And I gave the example last week that in the town of McAllen, uh, they had the emergency services pretty much drained, pretty much tapped dry by uh, trying to house all the people coming in there. Now, once again, if private individuals or churches or anybody else decide amongst themselves to feed and house these people, that's their business. I don't have any issue with that. But the problem comes when you start taking funds away from uh, the citizens in those communities. Now, if they had a town hall meeting, they said, hey, Bring them here, we'll take care of them, that's awesome. But it's uh, just, end of the day, it's not the most economically feasible thing to bring so many people into your country. Now with that said, we now see that Austria is reinstating border controls as refugees come into the country. And it says the move follows the closing of the border over the weekend by Germany. Germany says the situation is the worst refugee crisis since the end of the Second World War. It is now reappraising its open arms policy towards immigrants. Austria plans to deploy the army to stem the influx of refugees from Syria in the greater Middle East and Africa. Now, as I'm saying, it's not the most economically feasible thing that you can do. You know, as good as your heart may be, your wallet may not be as open as your heart is. And once again, I'll, I'm not debating anybody. Yeah, we spend money on wars and all types of other things and NSA and stuff that is completely uh, neutered and doesn't really solve any of the problems that we have. And I wouldn't mind having... Those things uh, cut down as far as the budgets were concerned. But until that happens, you know, we can't just bring people in, just open open door policy. And more to this, you have situations of people who aren't exactly the best characters coming into your country. Now, does that to say that everybody who comes from a foreign country is bad? Not at all. 
Is that to say that everybody from a foreign country is coming to start some kind of problem? Not at all. But we had a chance to speak to the Border Patrol last year, and they said uh, some people come in, you know, they're gang-affiliated, and they say, how do you know they're gang-affiliated? Oh, they have MS-13 tattoos, and then we let them go, then they go and commit a crime. Or they say some people, they come in, and they're sick. And I say, well, how do you know they're sick? Because they have tuberculosis, they have scabies, they have this or that. And the Border Patrol is not trained, nor do they have the facilities or the financing to treat people medically. So they say they basically have people in pretty much, you know, a big warehouse. They're sneezing and coughing on each other, so one person makes 20 people sick. And then your problem grows from there. Once again, that's not all people, but some people are sick or they may have uh, some type of uh, ill intent when they come here. With that said, Homeland Security Chairman, he said, we do not have the systems in place to properly vet refugees. And the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee has urged that the facilities are not in place to properly vet refugees coming in the, to the U.S. from Syria and Iraq, and that it is reckless and dangerous policy to accept at least 10,000 of them as proposed by the Obama administration. Now, once again, if you know Barack Obama wants to move as many people as possible into the White House, more power to him. But as I keep pointing out, the issue is they're putting them into these small communities and making them foot the bills. And all these politicians, I know you see them on TV, oh, if I could take all these people home with me, I would. They don't take one home with them. And once again, you can welcome to do that if you want to, but you can't put this burden on people who didn't ask for it and then say they're not humanitarian when you're not willing to do the same thing you're asking them to do. And I'll give the example of uh, people, every day you get on the bus, you get in your car, you go someplace, you go to work, you go to school, whatever, you probably pass a homeless person. And with this in mind, do you always stop your car? Do you get off the bus and hand this homeless person a dollar? No, you don't. And you, it's your discretion. You may have a very good reason for not doing so. But at the same time, if people in a certain community say, hey, I've got three kids and a house payment and whatever else, and I'm working two jobs at, uh, at the Quick Trip or at the you know, Mini Mart around the corner, I just can't be economically feasibly care for any more uh, expenditures on my budget. That's their business. If they can't afford it, they can't afford it. And I don't think that we should come down hard on the people in certain select communities who choose not to uh, fund these things out of their own pocketbook. Now, let's switch gears now and talk about things that are going on here domestically as far as policing is concerned. You know, every day it seems like we have another situation of uh, police brutality. But that's not to say that all police are bad, and we're going to cover that here in just one second. Now we have a situation where a man encountered officers. He was beaten rather severely. And he said, I thought the police were supposed to be the good guys. I just started screaming for someone to help me, and he began hitting me even harder and faster. As the shine is light in my car window, repeatedly. And uh, after a while, I decided, you know, maybe I should get out of the vehicle and ask the officer what the problem is. By the time he threw me on the ground and, and, and hit me a, a couple times with his elbow, at that point, I was like, this isn't a police officer. This is just some guy here to kill me. But as I alluded to earlier, not all officers are out there in the streets looking to do people harm. Sometimes the harm comes to the officers. And now we have the article by Paul Joseph Watson. It says, cop killer was a Black Lives Matter supporter. And it says, Joseph Shanks gunned down a Kentucky, uh, Kentucky State Trooper Joseph Ponder after a high-speed chase last night. And as I talked to Leanne McAdoo about a couple weeks back, talking about Black Lives Matter, even though this person may be affiliated with Black Lives Matter, that's not indicative of all the people in that movement. And I gave the example. We go out to uh, various places around the country over the past year, myself, Joe Biggs, and some of the other crew as well. And they would show these guys, you know, Black Lives Matter t-shirts or with the Black Lives Matter posters, banners, you know, doing criminal activity or harassing people or doing all these uh, mischievous things or sometimes downright criminal things. But, you know, while they're looking the camera over here, if they would just turn the camera around, there'd be 3,000 people marching down the street peacefully with, you know, minor traffic concerns. And they don't want to talk about that. You know, it'd be, uh, you know, a brief news story. And as soon as the march was over, you never saw it again. But you always see the picture of the guy with his pants down, running through the liquor store or wherever the, the place was. Those type of things keep getting repeated over and over again. But the thousands of other peaceful people who didn't hurt anybody, maybe, uh, you know, blocked the street off briefly. And when we went to Ferguson, I'll just say this to anybody who wasn't there, because I understand when you're looking through the narrow focus of a camera, you may not understand everything that's going on. The cops had those streets blocked off in Ferguson, or at least back in August. So when you see all the cops, or the protests were shutting down that street. On West Florissant, that night we shot the tear gas, the cops had the street blocked off, not the protesters. So that's just a little food for thought and uh, not to demonize the whole movement by this one individual. And I uh, hope the information comes out and the appropriate measures are taken. 
Now, that was what you would call a coward with a gun. Now, here's somebody who has a very positive look on the Second Amendment. Usually, when you see uh, beauty pageants, sometimes they're more, more likely known for uh, silly or not very well thought out answers. You can go watch those beauty pageant clips on TV, and the girls like the Iraq and uh, some of the the uh, world peace and all these other things and uh, all, all this crazy stuff. But anyway, somebody came out and had a very eloquent answer. And lo and behold, this is a black lady from South Carolina, a black contestant, and she realizes that she doesn't want to ban firearms because somebody may come into her church and kill her. She doesn't want that in her life. So now this is her response when somebody asked her what she thought about firearms in our country. Do you support a ban on military-style assault weapons? I don't, but I think it's because we need to increase education. We have to go back there. If we teach people the proper way to use guns, then we will reduce the, the risk of having gun-related um, <laughs> gun accidents. It starts with education. Now, some people are speculating that that type of answer costs her the crown. I don't watch beauty pageants, so I can't really speculate as towards that. But, you know, these are the type of things and things I think probably should be referenced when we actually have these things to show that these aren't just, you know, pretty girls up there, but they have brains. You know, sometimes it's difficult for them to speak on the spot. They get asked some very difficult questions and give sometimes very amusing answers. But these are the type of things that we should showcase so more people can be aware of the things that are going on in our country, just like uh, the beauty pageant. Somebody asked her what her thoughts were on gay marriage, and she said, I believe that, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman. And some people just couldn't handle that because we live in a country, as much as people say that they're liberal and progressive and accepting of other people's thoughts and viewpoints, they say that until they actually meet somebody who has a different thought or viewpoint. And then they're a hate monger, or they're a bigot, or they're this or they're that. Because, you know, we, you can walk down the street and you can have a gay pride parade, for example. You can have thousands of people walking down the street, you know, with their rainbow flags or whatever else. And they have free speech in the United States of America. But if some little old lady wants to stand on the sidewalk with a sign that says, I love Jesus, they want to come after her and attack her. And we've actually seen those things where preachers have gone to various events. And I'm not bashing gay people. I'm just using this as an example. But they go to an event and they get attacked by the people there because they're standing there with a sign. You know, and, and that's the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy that some people have when they talk about free speech in our country. And it's not just on that. It's going all the way down the list. Uh, whether it's uh, the NSA and the spying and all those type of things, those measures where you have uh, congressmen or senators. You know, it's fine when everybody else is getting spied on. I'll use uh, Dianne Feinstein as an example. Uh, Dianne Feinstein thought it was peachy keen when you and I were getting spied on, but when she found out they were spying on her, then she had a problem. Then people started flying drones up to her windows and all that. And she was like, oh, man, we got to shut this stuff down. But when it was happening to you and me and they thought they were immune, they had no issue with it. But it's like that all across the board. Uh, I would imagine so on anything. You know, it's fine as long as it's not happening to you. Just like we see instances of, uh, matter of fact, we went out to uh, some of these things, these uh, riots or the aftermath over the past year. And sometimes I'd see the police doing some very harsh measures against peaceful people. Now, once again, yeah, there was looting and burning cars and burning buildings and all that stuff. And I'm not, a, you know, trying to sweep that under the rug. That stuff definitely happened. But when you come out there and you are aggressive towards a peaceful group of people, I asked some of the officers point blank. I said, what would you do if maybe one of your kids is out here in this crowd? And do you think like this will never happen, that what your, one of your children may want to come out and protest some peaceful event like this? And then you guys shoot rubber bullets and tear gas at them. And, you know, they didn't really have anything to say about that. But not to belabor the point, let's completely switch gears now and talk about how people are dressing around the United States of America. Because we've seen in other countries, they're telling uh, uh, some of the young ladies not to wear mini skirts or, you know, uh, what I refer to as booty shorts. I'm sure there's an actual term for them. But, you know, the very tight, reveal revealing clothing. And uh, I will say sometimes I wish people wouldn't wear those, not because <laughs> uh, any, it makes me want to do anything. I'm just like, oh, man, I really wish you would cover that up. But now in Alabama, they're trying to pass an ordinance that says that you cannot wear a mini skirt in public. And they were talking about how they already had a measure in place where they were trying to ban guys from sagging their pants, which I think also can be pretty goofy. And let me talk about sagging pants here for one second before we go any further in this. When I see 